Um, uh, right now, we're going to do that first panel discussion that I mentioned this morning. Um, so if you would, please welcome to, back to the, uh, not to the stage, but to the podium uh, for a panel conversation, uh, Charlie Moorcraft, Michael Burrell, uh, Lisbeth Holberg, and Fleming Nielsen, please. So, this is where I get all hands and legs um, with my iPad on the go uh, to take a look at your uh, excellent questions that have been coming in. And we do have a couple of microphones available on the flanks that if, you, uh, if your question's not being asked or if there's something that comes up in the conversation, you go, oh, I have a question I'd like to ask about that. Fire your hand up in the air and we'll get you a microphone. Okay? So, thank you for joining us up here in the middle, everybody. Um, like Fleming, I'm going to come uh, to you first, if that's okay. So, I, I, there's a question in here that I think works, uh, really works with, with something that you've got an opinion on. Um, the, the question is this, when you say, oh, uh, sorry, I should, I should just point out that part of what I'm doing here in selecting the questions is um, being all modern and everything, as I am, uh, I'm looking for the little likes. And there are questions that have likes, a lot of likes next to them, so I'm going to pick a few of the ones that are quite popular. Um, so no offense if your question doesn't come up. If it doesn't come up, grab a microphone and we'll get it done. Um, but this first question is very simply put, um, and the question is, when you say cheaper, how can you put a price tag on safety? Now, I know INEOS has been through a significant cost optimization program. Uh, big reduction in numbers of people, big reduction in costs, but not a huge impact on safety. How did you manage that? Uh, and, and not what only would you did say we not, in response to this question. Yeah. yeah. So uh, not only did we not have a huge impact in safety, uh, we had an impact that we improved the safety during this period. Mm. Um, Ineos has gone through a sobering exercise, like many other oil companies, in trying to cope with the falling oil prices we saw some years ago. And um, we started a program where we had to look at our fixed base costs, and we also had to look at organization. And during that time, it, it was also quite clear that safety can't be compromised at all. Um, so we had quite a few conversations on how to go about this whilst going through the process. And one thing is clear when you go through the process is that people get more nervous, they get anxious on the future, and you can risk the, uh, that you lack focus in what you do. And that can in itself be an unsafe way of working. So we spend a lot of time, and I can see my colleagues sitting here close to me nodding their heads, and we spend a lot of time talking about the focus. So actually, when you go through a process like that, and I think a lot of you have seen that, everyone is looking at management and trying to interpret it. Where is this going to end? What is this organization mm. going to look like? What does mm. it mean to me? Mm. So they will also in, or interpret it, what you're doing. And that means you need to turn up on what you do and not what you say, because they will look at what you do and not what you say. So we increased the management presence a lot. Mm. We did talk a lot about the focus, and then we did two things. First of all, we, like you saw this morning at the Safety Award, uh, we increased the management presence at the Safety Toolbox Talks. That in itself gave a lot of positive reactions. The other thing we did was we said, well, let's try during this process, let's try and increase the amount of reporting. No KPIs, we just want you to do it even more than you did before. And just like Mr. Hopkins said, you need to follow that up. And it actually brought out quite an interesting thing. And in the management team, what we did, we said, well, let's even look at the smallest things. And can we see signs of weaknesses? Mm. And I'd like to give you one example, please. We had uh, one night, we had a small production deferment. 
uh, in the control room, there was some alarms that were overlooked. They weren't safety critical, but it actually meant that we had a slight production deferment during that night shift. And we went on, okay, so the guys trained, a lot of experience, and still, why was this happening? So in trying to engage with the crew and, and this gentleman, saying what really happened, we found out that he had personal issues, and he also had an issue about working at night. But that was not the important conversation. The important conversation was, why didn't he feel comfortable in raising that before we going on the shift? Mm. Because that could have led to a lot of safety incidents. So where we in the past maybe wouldn't have seen that report that way, because it was a small production deferment, we now escalated that, saying, well, that's an undermining thing here we need to talk about. Mm. So yes, we've been through this process, and I can say that, that that was mentioned this morning, we haven't had any LCI since uh, the summer of 17. Mm. Mm. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks, Fleming. Um, Elizabeth, if I may come to you. Um, you, you, you are a, an expert in accident investigation, you work um, in, and, and in other areas, but you work across a number of industries, not just the oil and gas industry. There's a question in here that is simply put, what can the oil and gas industry learn from other industries? What would you share in that regard? Yeah. It's a big question, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously oil and gas has for among others, the, uh, the, uh, the Piper Elfer accident, a head start from, from a lot of other industries when we talk about safety and, and we talk about regulations and we talk about procedures and the way we do things and leadership. Um, and I was raised in oil and gas, so, so that's, that's where I come from. But when I now start working with the wind, I see that they're picking up. They're also picking up on people that have worked in oil and gas because it's a growing industry. So they're picking up and taking that into other industries, construction and, and manufacturing and, and, and mm. pharmaceuticals. And um, the head start is not as, it's not as widespread as, as it used to be. So they're picking up. And um, I see some signs that it's, it's a hard word to use complacency in oil and gas. But there are some signs of also now when, when uh, Andrew Hopkins is, is referring to the, mm. the maturity ladder, yeah. there are some things happening where we, we, we do say things in oil and gas that come from the second step. I do see that. Mm. Um, mm. And I do see, uh, for example, construction industry, pharmaceutical, I see whole companies and envelopes doing things that are definitely up to spec with, with the way we've worked with safety in, in oil and gas for, for a long time. Yeah. Where the big difference still is with oil and gas is around leadership. Because when we talk about um, incident investigation and the initial thoughts around how we look at people that made a mistake or didn't do something we wanted them to do, mm. there is a very hard talk in the in the early days about we don't fire I, I tell my the people I work with you don't fire anyone for doing making a mistake you actually go as far as, as saying thank you for telling us this bad news mm. and maybe even to to what Andrew Hopkins was saying celebrating it but that is really really far away in the mindset of leaders in in, um, in most industries outside of oil and gas so that's where the yeah. We're still in oil and gas, very far ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's very unusual in the world for someone to say, hey boss, I made a mistake. And you go, woohoo, thanks for telling me. It's very unusual. All right, um, Mike. <laughs> Regarding, so you shared very generously about Total's safety journey. Regarding that journey, what, was, what worked best in your view and what was most challenging for you? Um, well, perhaps I'll answer the last question then, mm. um, rather than that one. I'll come back to that one. Give me a moment just to think about sure. it. Because you mentioned one thing, Elizabeth, about complacency. And we talked briefly about it last night. And I think you're absolutely right that 
over the past 15 years, I've seen the North Sea, in particular, being rather complacent about its performance. And while I would contend that at the end of the 90s, the North Sea was at the top of where it could be in terms of safety performance and operational excellence, and here I'm specifically talking more about Norway and UK, because of the areas I know much better, so I'm only getting to know Denmark at the moment, mm. they then rested on their laurels. And it comes through from an industry that's been going and is now starting to get mature 20 years in. We've had Piper Alpha, we've done safety cases, we know this stuff. Right. And we're good. Right. In fact, we're better than the others. And I often got challenged, well, the guys in Nigeria or Indonesia, they cheat on their statistics. <laughs> They do not cheat on their statistics. We do exactly the same in every country around the world. And it's the UKs and the Norways and a little bit the Denmarks who are not as good as they think they are. And that's where the complacency has crept in. And that's where conferences like this are really good because we can then get the North Sea back to its rightful place, which is right at the forefront of everything that's good about oil and gas, mm. including safety. But I put it that way around specifically because it's about excellence in operations. So then to try and answer your question, sure. which about what were the, the, the best things that we've achieved are management focus and, and time on site with the guys that are actually responsible for our operations. Mm. And the second point of that is being really clear about your messages. That's this thing I was trying to get across about, yes. it's not a top priority. Because if it's a top priority, that means there are other priorities. You know, one day, they're going to they're gonna overlap. Yeah. It's a core value for us. And safety has to be there. And if it's not there, I don't want you to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not part of our business. I had, a, I had a super example in Canada where I had the, the, the owner of the drilling company that were drilling wells for us, who they had a big incident on one of their rigs, and we'd warned them, and I'd spoken to him individually, and then he personally, in the middle of the night, went to get pipe from the yard, because they'd run out of drill pipe, and they didn't want to stop the operations. Of course, they don't have the equipment. He ended up breaking his knee, because he was standing on the pipe with a crowbar, trying to get pipe onto the back of his truck. We called him in, I said, you've not understood. He said, but Mike, we wanted to keep the operations going. And shit happens. Mm. Well, shit doesn't happen in my organization, and we don't want you to do that. And if you haven't understood now, perhaps understand when you bid for next time, because now you're off the job. Mm. And so it's, you know, it's, it's all about getting out there and being on site with the people that are dealing with safety and being really clear about your messages. You have to wear your PPE. And I'm going to wear my PPE when I go out. I don't care it's uncomfortable. Those damn safety goggles are never good when you wear specs, but you have to wear them. You have to show exemplarity. Mm. And sometimes that's the hardest thing. And it, but, it, but it's so key for us, because the moment you let the exemplarity slip, it's like trust. I trust you. The moment you do something where, I, where you lose my trust, it's going to take you years to build it back up. Mm. Safety's all about that. You have to be exemplary all the time. We have a thing about, I'll just want, tell me one last story. Mm. We have a thing in our organization about holding handrails. You know, I, t I talked to you about three fatalities this year, two falling from the height of the stage. Mm. You know, this is horrendous. We have to hold the handrails. There's a young lady in this audience here that came to me when I was in Esberg two weeks ago and said, Mike, I saw you come into the office. I had my little wheelie bag, I had my briefcase, I'm walking up, it's four steps. I didn't hold the handrail. She had the courage, and that's the last part, is the courage to come to me and say, Mr. Borrell, you didn't hold the handrail. That's hard hitting, it's our DNA. It's, it's the core value of the organization. Yeah. So the last bit is the courage bit, and that's probably the most difficult bit. Right. People have to stand up. Mm -hmm. What you're doing isn't safe. Yeah. Use my stop card. That's the safety for me, for you, for all. Very nice. And perhaps building on that, Charlie. Um, this is not addressed directly to you, but I'm pretty sure this question is to you. How did your company respond to the accident? Did they back you and support you even though you didn't follow procedures? And what could your manager and colleagues have done 
before your accident happened? Okay, it's a good, good question. Did they support me? Uh, actually, Exxon treated me golden. Mm. Because they, and there's three reasons for that. One, they thought that they had, um, they should have changed the blanks out sooner. Mm. Two, uh, they knew the shortcuts were being taken. I, was, I didn't invent that shortcut. I was, I, it was passed on to me. And the unfortunate thing about that was I then passed that shortcut on to the guy I was training. And three, they thought I'd make a hell of a safety guy if they get a bit turning around. So that's, that's the reason they, did, they didn't fire me. I actually wish they had fired me five minutes before the accident occurred, you know. But that doesn't answer the question I think a lot of people want to ask me, is what do I think of firing people for safety violations? That, that's a loaded question. That's a loaded question. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a union guy or I'm part of labor. And as part of labor, I never, ever want to see anyone fired for a safety violation, you know, or, or, or even disciplined. But I've been a safety guy now for a number of years. And I was a safety guy on the night that a 21-year-old iron worker fell off the top of our cap plant and died because he didn't have his harness on. He had the harness on, but he didn't clip it off. And he died. And I swore that would never happen again. And I'd be going to work, and I'd be talking to the iron workers and the steel workers about wearing their harnesses. And I was getting absolutely no place, absolutely no place. So finally, this one day I went into work and there's all the iron workers again up in a structure without their harnesses on. I said, everybody down. And they all came down and said, listen guys, I finally decided what we're gonna do about these harnesses. And I've decided that if you don't wanna wear them, if you don't wanna wear them, you don't have to. You don't have to. You just can't work here. Just can't work here. I don't fire anyone. I, I give them the choice, but I'll never allow another kid to die in one of my jobs. I'm not the cop out there. It's totally up to you, wear it or not. I, it's, it, it's your choice. I'm, I'm not a cop, I'm the safety guy. You know, so it's, 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 it's totally up to you. I'm not sure I answered your question. Um, what you're saying is good, so keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, I, I'm, I, uh, I'm reality, let's put it that way. I, I shoot from the hip, I, 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 talk, I, I talk about the way things really, really are. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm a guy from the field, and I know, I know, what, I know what goes on out there, you know, and I, I agree with every, everything that was said here, you know, and I, but I put it in, maybe in, in simpler terms. You know, when you're talking about safety and how, how can you do it cheaper, you know, and still be safe. I think about the time when we had a, we had a, a compressor room that was noisy as hell wasn't above 85 dBAs, but it was, it was really loud. And we were hurting for money at that time. The refinery was hurting for money, as they always are, you know. <laughs> and uh, we had a choice. They could build this brand new uh, building for the, you know, to contain the noise, soundproof it and everything else. And that would have cost, I forget how many millions of dollars it was that the union wanted us to do. And, uh, or the other choice was, we could all wear the noise-canceling earphones, you know. Obviously, wear the noise-canceling earphones. Why spend six million dollars when you can spend a few hundred dollars on, on earphones? There's always a way to do it slightly inexpensive and, 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 and achieve the same exact goal, you know. So mm. Mm. that's the way I feel about things. You know? um, it, thanks, it's not as eloquent as you were, <laughs> but I think we... Had, attain the same, uh, same objective. You know? Yes, yeah. Um, thanks, Charlie. And it's, it's, it's not phrased exactly this way in here, um, and, and people have said things on the break about how much you get people thinking about family, not just the, the, your accident and how it happened uh -huh. and, the, and the detail about your, how badly injured you were and the effect on your life, uh, but but that you really get people thinking about family in the way that you share. Is there anything else you want to share regarding family, Jennifer? What else is there for you? Yeah, people. Yes. Uh, a well, lot of times. Well, we have you here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. A lot of times, people are afraid to ask me, "What did my daughter's death have to do with my my accident? You know, what what could that possibly have to do with my accident?" 
and I'm not proud of this. I'm, I'm not proud of this at all. Uh, and first, you got to get this. this is not an excuse, not an excuse, not an excuse. But burn victims have a very high incident rate of, of alcoholism, drug addiction, suicide, and divorce. And I hit every one of those things. And I pushed everyone and everything away from me, including my daughters. Both my daughters turned to drugs and alcohol. When my daughter Jennifer died, she had seven years sobriety under her belt. But when she got pneumonia and bronchitis, she had done enough damage to her body that her body couldn't sustain her, and she died. Now, I've read every book on the subject. I speak about alcohol and drugs um, a lot. And if you read any of the books, I'm sorry I have my back to you people. I don't, I don't mean to. But uh, if you read any of the books, it'll say, it wasn't my fault that my daughters had their own path to travel and their own choices in life to make. And intellectually, I can get that. I can get that. But in here, where it counts, I'll always wonder if I was around for the five years that I was in the hospitals when my kids were little, they were 10 and 13, would my daughter Jennifer be alive today? I don't know. And I never will know. But you can know. You still have your families. And all you got to do is take care of yourselves. That's all you got to do. It's not, this is not rocket science. <laughs> I mean, we can complicate the hell out of it, and we, we usually do. But it's really not rocket science. I keep telling people safety is about going home at the end of the day, kissing your spouse, hugging your kids. That's it. That's it. You know, so. Thank you. And on that note, please thank our panel. And before we go to lunch, he wants to close with something. I, because we didn't get to do questions and answers when I was up there, I always close with one thing, and I made a personal commitment a long time ago to speak about this. And it's, um, you know, what bothered me the most about the accident, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I, missed my, I missed my kids growing up. I just wasn't there for them. And if I could leave you with anything else, you know, you realize, I can remember laying there, dying, saying to myself, my God, I'm going to die here. I never got to tell my children, or I never got to tell my family how much I truly loved them or how much I cared about them. I just never took the time to sit them down and talk to them. I was too busy caught up in all the other things you caught up in life, you know, working and making money and giving them things. And I just never took the time to sit them down and tell them how much I cared. But I got that opportunity because I lived, you know, I lived. And thank God I got to tell Jennifer. So if I could leave you with anything else, you also have the opportunity to tell someone how much you care about them, how much you love them. You have no idea the impact your lives have on other people. No idea the impact. You haven't had a chance to tell them recently how much you care. Do it. You'll be shocked at the outcome. And if you can't be safe for you, do it for your loved ones, huh? Do for them. Thank you. <laughs>